Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College London. I'm Mark Pennington, the Director of the Centre and Head of the Department of Political Economy, where the Centre is based. We're very pleased to have with us today Professor Mark Beaver. Mark is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Centre for British Studies at University of California, Berkeley. He's been a pioneer in the analysis of governance institutions and especially analysis that draws on an interpretive approach to political science. Among his many books are The Logic of the History of Ideas, Interpreting British Governance, New Labour, a Critique, Democratic Governance, and most recently, Interpretive Social Science. Welcome, Mark. It's very good to have you with us here today at the Centre and in the Department. I wonder if you could start off by saying a little bit about what you've been working on most recently, perhaps the book on Interpretive Social Science. Yeah, um, well, that's the most recent big project I was involved in, and um, I think it's probably pulls together ideas that really go back to the first book I wrote, The Logic of the History of Ideas. But The Logic of the History of Ideas was very heavily philosophical and about a fairly narrow part of the social sciences. Um, And the Interpretive Social Science book, which I co-authored with Jason Blakely, is meant to be broader covering the social sciences as a whole and it's meant to move beyond what we might think of philosophy to also look at issues of methods and the sorts of explanations found by people who you might think of as practicing social and interpretive style of social science from Charles Taylor to Michel Foucault. Excellent. So could you say a little bit about what you think is distinctive about the interpretive approach? So we we have you know, the typical dichotomy that people understand is one between an interpretive or hermeneutic mm. approach to social science and a more positivist view. And um, Positivism is normally associated with, associated with some notion that you can sort of read off almost in a mechanical way people's behaviour by understanding background conditions, whether they're economic incentives, if we're talking about neoclassical economists, or maybe macro structural conditions, if we're talking about Marxist influence theories. Whereas interpretivism emphasises some notion of creativity and more uncertainty in the kind of relationships. Could could you say a little bit more about whether you think, is that a reasonable understanding of the difference between the two, or is it is it much deeper than that? Um, I think approaches to social science are always a bit awkward to describe or define. Generally, they bundle together a preferred theory or philosophy, a preferred set of topics and a preferred set of methods or techniques. So the kind of positivism you're talking about, at least originally, it embodied a fairly positivist philosophy. It embodied a preference for topics that included political behaviour, voting behaviour, rather than describing institutions, for example. And it tended to like highly quantitative techniques. Um, I don't think those three things, the philosophy the topics and the methods have any necessary links with one another. They they loosely hold together, but they don't have to go together. In the case of an interpretive approach, I think it bundles together a philosophy that we might think of as hermeneutic or post-analytic or post-foundational um, with a preferred set of topics which tend to include the meanings that people attach to their actions, discourses and ideas, and a preferred set of techniques which are, broadly speaking, either textual or ethnographic. Um, I don't think those three things need to go together. You could adopt a highly quantitative yeah, approach to, to a study of text. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my own case, I come at interpretive social science very much from a philosophical perspective. So for me, the core issues are the way we think about human action and how we should explain it, rather than the methods we adopt to study it or the particular topics within human life that we study. And I think I think the key philosophical commitments in everyday terms are that When we think about ourselves or our friends, we think of ourselves or our friends as people who act for reasons that they are capable of altering. 
if we didn't think of them like that, it wouldn't make sense to debate with them, discuss with them, try yeah. to persuade them of things. And I don't even, I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like not to think of ourselves as people who act for reasons of our own and who are capable of reflecting on those reasons and changing them. And I think the more you see human beings like that, the more you have to take account of their reasoning if you want to explain their actions. Mm. Yeah, I can understand. I, I think that's that's very well put. It seems to me if, if you do adopt that approach, I take the point that um, there's a difference between, if you like, particular epistemological foundations for social science and attachment to particular sorts of methods. But it seems to me, nonetheless, that if you do adopt this kind of an approach, the implication is to really get an appreciation of the meanings people attach to their actions or the beliefs that they have or the traditions that they're situated in. You have to get up close mm -hmm. with the actors. You have to try to be in their heads. And that does imply um, something like a more ethnographic approach where you are trying to embed yourself in a, in a particular context rather than looking at it purely from the outside from some kind of external point of view. Is that fair or do you think that's, a, that's an oversimplification? I think it's both fair and an oversimplification. So I do think that if you're interested in people's reasoning, then you're obviously going to look at textual evidence and their actions and what they do and say to try and get a richer understanding of how they have a whole set of beliefs that sort of hold together. So in that sense, I think it's fair. But I also think it's an oversimplification for at least two reasons. And the first reason is that I don't think that we would automatically assume that the reasons people give for their actions are the actual reasons for those actions. Indeed, I'm not even sure that we would think the reasons we think are the reasons for our own actions are the actual reasons for which we act. So I think we should. there's also re grounds for scepticism yeah. about the kind of evidence that might come out of straightforward ethnographic studies or even more so straightforward textual studies. Um, so that would be one reason for thinking it's an oversimplification. The second reason points to, I think, a debate amongst interpretivists. I think there are interpretivists, particularly those who think of interpretivism primarily in terms of qualitative methods, who are very committed to the idea that things like ethnography provide richer analysis, richer understandings of the facts, an implication which they might not want to actually own of that view is that there are facts which mm. they can recover through appropriate methods. Mm. That's not a view I share. Mm. I come from a much more post-foundational philosophical background so i regard all facts as things that are questionable and only hold together within wider sets of facts as it were uh, and that means that i don't think any method at all gives us absolutely certain facts hmm. so it might be the case that interpretivists have good reasons for adopting ethnography or textual analysis but i think it would be a mistake to assume that ethnography or textual analysis somehow provides secure facts in a way that, say, more quantitative survey work does not. Yeah. OK. One of the areas where you've applied this interpretive method, I think, to, to great effect is, is in trying to understand changes in governance relationships, especially within public sector organisation over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and as I understand it, what your work points to is the influence of a particular set of essentially social scientific beliefs about the problems that face, for example, hierarchical forms of uh, state bureaucracy. And your argument is that initially this was questioned from a kind of uh, market liberal perspective, public choice theory emphasizing contracts and markets as an alternative to hierarchy. And then later, we have the movement towards joined up governance approaches um, that are often associated with new labor in the UK. And that this is another set of social scientific ideas that say that markets produce excessive fragmentation and they need to be reintegrated in some sense. You make a very powerful claim that essentially it's social scientific ideas 
that drove this change to the kind of new governance arrangements that we that we see. I wonder whether you could just elaborate on why you think the actual social science has been important in the shift towards the kind of network governance arrangements that we see in the world today. Right. Um, I think I want to make two two points there. And, and the first is to limit the scope of the argument you're ascribing to me. Yeah. So I definitely think that what we might think of as modernist social science underlies the drive to create markets, contracting out, joined up governance within the public sector. But I also think that a large part of my work is designed to show how those policies fail. Mm -hmm. So what I actually think is that social science has under, underlies the reform agendas, yeah. but I don't think social science necessarily underlies the practices that have emerged out of those reform agendas. So that would be my first point. And then on the second point, why do I think that social science has played such an important role in the reform agendas. Well, I, if I go back for a moment to what I was saying about how I think about interpretive social science, I think we understand actions in terms of the meanings they embody or the ideas they embody. So reform agendas always embody ideas. And the question is, what sort of ideas? If you're looking at, say, um, the, the spread of the... British civil service in the late 19th century, you're looking at a certain sort of liberalism, a growing commitment to professionalism, but nothing like modernist social science, yeah. or not really like modernist social science, but there are ideas behind it. You know, so there are always ideas behind practices, institutions, and, and the question is which. Um, and I think that the reason that social science has played such an important role in the development of public sector reform agendas is that social science has become an incredibly prestigious way of trying to understand human life within our society. If we look at modern universities, the humanities or the classics, again, if you think of Victorian Britain, the civil service would have trained people, they would have been trained primarily in the classics, and the idea would have been that ancient models and ancient texts provided a generalist background, which was a good background for grappling with the problems of Britain and even of the empire. Um, but that's gone. And now, if you look at the humanities, relatively few people would turn to English literature or to history or to classics for guides about how to conduct contemporary affairs. They might for something like moral guidance, but they wouldn't for what we might think of as quasi-scientific expertise. So almost by default, when people are looking for quasi-scientific expertise into social life and what sorts of policies are best likely to reform it, they draw on the social sciences. So they go to look at Robert Putnam or they go to look at the public choice theorists or whoever, rather than going back to some sort of grander traditions of thought that people that have helped people to think about things in different ways. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. I think that's right. And I, I, I'm not saying that I think... I definitely don't particularly want to go back to the Victorian yeah. way, but I'm making the point that, yeah. that there's always sets of ideas that underlie political yeah. agendas and reform agendas. And what's happened is that in the 20th century there was a major shift from what we might think of as a generalist classical tradition of thought about the, the world to an increasingly modernist social science. Obviously, that's not a sharp distinction. There were forms of political yeah. economy that existed in Victorian Britain, although they were generally very historical by contemporary standards. Um, and what we would now regard as a v, as, as modern economics, neoclassical economics, really only arises in the 1880s or 1890s. So it is really a 20th century phenomenon that you get these sorts of knowledge wiping out things like historical modes of knowledge and appeals to classic texts as guides to political action. Okay. Can we pick up on something that you, you just mentioned before about you were saying that you're interested in the way in which many of these policy reforms within the public sector have failed mm -hmm. and perhaps connect that back to your um, interpretive method and approach. So as I understand what you're saying there, the problem is 
with these various reform agendas from, from whatever direction they come, whether it's reforms that try to introduce markets or reforms that try to introduce network governance or joined up governance. They fail to recognize that the actors on the ground or the actors who are required to implement the policies in various ways are going to be interpreting these practices in different ways, ways that are unpredictable to the actual person who's recommending the policy. And therefore, we get all kinds of unintended or emergent outcomes. Is that, is that an accurate description of what you're saying, that it's, it's actually a failure of these approaches to recognise that um, people will do things differently from what they expect, that means that they, they can't actually predict the way these reforms actually will play out? Yes, I think that's a pretty good summary. So the, the, what I want to suggest is if we go back to the distinction between broadly interpretivist approaches and broadly positivist approaches or non-interpretivist approaches, I'm a bit unhappy with the word positivism. Yeah. I'd rather use something like modernism, but it has less resonance, so let's stick with positivism. Um, I think that the more positivist approaches tend to try to for various reasons, they tend to avoid looking at people's meanings, or if they look at people's meanings, they tend to atomize individual beliefs and seek to correlate them with particular social facts about the people. And as a result, they don't they, they are really looking perhaps quite thoughtfully, this might be what they want. They're really looking to get simplifications. They're really looking to get simplified models. I suspect that most rational choice people don't think their models exactly are how the world works. And they, unless they're really silly, they almost certainly don't think the assumptions behind some of the models, particularly when they're applying models, are true of the world as a whole, right? What they think is, at the extreme case, the fact that the model fits proves its worth. And at a more, less extreme case, they merely think that the model is a useful heuristic for looking at various cases. And those seem to me not unreasonable claims. But what that is, they involve setting up a reified model and assuming it applies to the concrete case. And I think something so similar goes on with institutionalists as well. They offer reified generalizations, which are perhaps knowingly, perhaps unknowingly, simplifications of complex practices. And even if academics who are engaged in research using rational choice or institutionalism know that these things are simplifications or merely heuristics, by the time they're guiding, guiding public policy, they're often treated as though they're... Mm, I don't want to say infallible because politicians aren't that stupid, yeah. but you know they're often treated as though these are, are good guides to practice and they're good guides to what will happen. If you introduce this policy, our model tells you what will happen. And that's simply not the case. Okay. They're at best guides, yeah. and that means that there's always a gap between what the social science might be predicting about how people will react or implement a particular policy and how people will actually react to the policy or implement it. And that gap, I think, is a significant reason for the failure of many reforms to live up to the promise that is initially ascribed to them. So would this presumably this would also apply to areas like um, evidence-based public policy where people believe that you know, the evidence points in a certain direction, therefore certain policies will be implemented or, or should be implemented. Or if you look at, um, you know, the focus at the moment on, say, randomised control trials, uh, would the kind of critique that you're, you're applying sort of transfer across to these kind of ideas as they're going into government, that the way those models or approaches will actually be interpreted is going to be rather different? to the people who are actually at what the people who are espousing them are expecting them to be used, the way they're expecting them to be used. Yes. Yes. I mean, th there are differences. So, as I, I think what, what you've just said is very much true, for instance, of the original evidence-based policy-making movement, particularly outside healthcare policy. Within healthcare, I think things are slightly different because to some extent there you can be dealing with physiological facts about humans. Yes. And those physiological facts are not things where we necessarily need to appeal to people's reasoning. 
But once a po- the evidence-based policy making is taken out of the, the straightforward health arena and how effective certain drugs are or certain treatments are, and it's applied to non-physiological domains, then I think the critique I've been offering runs pretty much directly through it. Where I think things are slightly different is with the recent rise of big data. Because in, again, I don't want to suggest this is true of everyone who's involved in the big data movement, but some people who believe in big data explicitly disavow that what they are doing is crafting explanations. What they're saying is that the data enables to pick out patterns, and then they suggest pursuing, assuming those patterns will persist is a better guide than anything that looks more like a formal explanation. And, and that, I think, is something slightly different. Could you say a little bit more about that? So, I mean, so in your approach, as I understand the interpretive approach, you do allow for the idea that there are patterns in the sense that particular traditions Mm -hmm. that sort of knit together in a certain way can create a certain regularity. But what you're saying is there's no inherent necessity for that regularity to be there, that at some point there can be some kind of rupture or change from a shift in people's beliefs, uh, maybe some kind of exogenous event um, that breaks up what look like long-established patterns. Now, it strikes me that that would apply also to what's happening with with big data, as you just described it, that these models or these techniques could be useful in picking out certain patterns. But we don't know when those are going to break down, when there's going to be some kind of rupture mm. uh, that the model isn't necessarily anticipating and isn't able to, given the very nature of the problem that we're, we're looking at. Yeah, I, I think I am saying that. Um, yes, I, th- I think I am saying that when people find a pattern, there's a danger that the pattern will cease to apply because of the contingency of human action. But I think actually, I'm at a fundamental level, I'm saying something, I'm offering a rather different critique of yeah. patterns. I think, I think I, what I'm saying is that in human life, there are no natural kinds. So when, when we find a pattern and we say X, is, X seems to go along with Y, X is not a kind in the way that, say, if we say water runs downhill, water is a kind. So therefore, there's a question about what the ontological standing of the objects we evoke within our patterns is. And it seems to me that they are things we evoke to make sense of the world as best we can. And that means that there are all kinds of patterns we can find. And it doesn't mean that any of the patterns have some sort of real existence. Instead, they're descriptive categories we use. Mm. So imagine that somebody's trying to find patterns around a a widespread social science concept like neoliberalism. Mm. Often what you get is incredibly dreary and dull debates about what neoliberalism is, as though there's a right answer. Now, the idea that there must be a right answer there presupposes that neoliberalism is a natural kind akin to water, and it isn't, right? It's not. So the content we give to a concept of neoliberalism is not set by what neoliberalism is. Rather, the content we give to it must be justified by the claim that giving it that content best describes or explains Mm -hmm. the cluster of instances that we're interested in. So from that perspective, I think, as well as wanting to say that the patterns we find can change, another thing I want to say is that patterns are products of our intellectual ingenuity. They're not things that are actually built into the world. I mean, that's a complex claim, but they're not Patterns themselves, interpretations. Yes, exactly. And and, and and particularly as descriptive ones, it's a real mistake to assume that because I can describe a bunch of phenomena using one particular abstract concept, therefore those phenomena have some sort of essential feature which is the same. Yeah. Just mo- moving on from that, um, I wonder if we could say something about the tendency for social science and I think arguably some people would say this is the case with people who are advocating use of big data today Um, people still very much seem to believe that social science or good social science should be able to predict 
in some sense, behaviour. And if we take the sort of view, as I understand it, that you're putting forward, there are severe limits to our capacity to predict because there are always going to be these unexpected contingencies or developments. And I guess, you know, I mean, I, I suppose it's fairly commonplace to say this nowadays, but if we look back to to the most significant events in the last 10, 15 years, the financial crisis was not predicted uh, by most economists. And likewise, the rise of populist movements um, has not been predicted by most political scientists. Um, why do you think, given these sort of manifest failures of predictive social science, so many people do want to <laughs> cling to the notion that good social science is science that predicts, in some sense, people's behavior? Um. It's an interesting question. I'm not. I mean, I think I think we need to be careful about assuming they do. Actually, I mean, I think I think with amongst academics, I think prediction is often treated as at best a secondary property of theories, where the primary property is explanation. Yeah. So what people are actually interested in is offering an explanation that fits their data, yeah. and then. That in so far as the explanation fits the data, particularly if they are they are committed to a loosely positivist philosophy, they're likely to want to assume that then the explanation also provides a basis on which to offer to predict predictions. Events. Yeah, but I think I think amongst academics, the emphasis often falls on explanation, explanation. more than prediction. But of course, when academics or academic ideas find their way into public organisations, but also private organisations, mm. the public and private actors are often much more interested in treating the, the academic theories as guides to action than they are in explanations of past events or, mm. or of large sets of data. And therefore, the, the original principal emphasis on explanation gets replaced by a, a, a new emphasis on prediction. Um, so I think we need to be a little bit careful yeah. about assuming that there is this straightforward drive directly towards prediction. I, I think an awful lot of academics would hesitate to imagine that they are yeah. in the game of prediction. So it's the explanatory quality of the, the theory yeah. that, that is most important yeah. I think, to most people operating. I, I think, yeah, I think most academics are really interested in the explanation. And then I think that the fact that much of social science is dominated by loosely positivist theorising means that for those academics, there is a sense in which a valid explanation, at least in principle, ought to enable them to do some sort of predictive work. And I think that sense that there ought to be some sort of predictive work here is something it's easy for non-academics in the public or private sectors to grab hold of and say, yeah. aha, so this yeah. is offering us yeah. a way of going forward and acting yeah. in a way that will produce relatively predictable outcomes. So, so in a sense here, sort of a, almost like an unintended consequence of people working in a particular vein is that those ideas can be taken on by other players. Yeah politicians, for example, yeah. or people in business organizations, and use um, the results, if you like, to try to exercise some form of sort of social control or something of that kind. Is that? Is that yeah, I think, I think that's think? right. If I, I mean, it's nice to make friends and influence people. And if, if I'm being nice to my academic colleagues, <laughs> most of them would be horrified at the use that is made yeah. of a lot of their ideas and an awful lot of very obscure academic papers that nobody but an other academic would read will begin with avowedly disclaiming the kind of simplistic interpretations that it are later put upon the relevant sort of work but if I'm being nastier to my academic colleagues if I give <laughs> up on the idea of making friends and influencing people then it does seem to me that although they write in disclaimers that suggest that you know this knowledge only applies under these uh, circumstances and well we're not certain and this is just one study although their work is full of these sorts of disclaimers they nonetheless peddle their work within a loosely positivistic or modernistic framing which actively encourages people to imagine that the kind of formal knowledge they're offering not only does explanatory work on data sets but thereby cuts nature at its joints 
finds natural kinds and offers a certain sort of expertise which does indeed provide a, a fairly viable guide to action and to prediction. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I mean, what you just said there could be construed as, um, you know, something that in many ways is, is quite critical of a sort of expert-centered view of the world. Um, the idea that there is a body of of expertise which understands how societies function and how they can be controlled. Um, in essence, what, what you're saying is that more often than not, that simply isn't the case, other than people might believe this to be the case and the implications that follow from that. Um, in some of your writings, you propose what you refer to as a more decentered approach to public policy. And I understand that to be decentered in two senses. It's decentered in the sense that you recognize the importance of local contingency, variety, unpredictability. But it's also decentered in the sense that you are wanting to, at least as I understand it, dethrone the power of experts and to empower citizens much more, to be involved in the policy process, recognizing that they have forms of expertise, mm-hmm. knowledge, local knowledge, people often refer to it, um, that simply isn't available to experts who don't have access to the kind of interpretations that are actually informing their on the ground actions. Do you think those things do follow in the way that I've, I've just put that forward? Loosely, yes. I mean, I think um, I think my primary intellectual commitment would be to the first one. Yeah. So you can, if if one thinks, it's tempting to think of decentering as reacting against centralised powers. Yeah. So that what one's interested in, if one's interested in decentering, is sort of akin to decentralization yeah. as an older world yeah. word. And I'm not opposed to that. But really, what I'm thinking of is more where centering is what happens when people think of um, a social object as if it was a natural kind with an essence. So perhaps, let's pick a, a yeah. slightly outdated example. Perhaps people think of the state. As an, as an entity, perhaps they're Marxists and they think yeah. of the state as necessarily, as it's at its essence, the capitalist state is about protecting the interests of capital. So the centering, what's centred is a particular concept. Yeah. And, and that concept presupposes that some social yeah, an thing essence. has an essence, yeah. right? And decentering consists of exploring an empirical case or cases of the relevant social object and showing that it doesn't have that essence and that it's fought over, that there is battles within it about what it should be, about the ideas and practices that it should deliver and that different people are pulling in different directions. So it's about showing that social objects that many social scientists treat as though they're natural kinds are actually complex battlegrounds full of contests and contingency. Um, and, and I do think that, to get on to your second idea, I do think that does at least point us towards more citizen involvement in policy making, because it suggests that the sorts of expertise we were talking about earlier, the sort of prediction, isn't really viable, uh, or it is overly blown in its promise, and that it would at least be sensible to explore the actual reasoning of the targets of a policy and ask how are they likely to act. So it does Mm -hmm. seem to push us, I think, towards involving people in policy making more, considering their beliefs more, considering their reasoning more, and trying to develop a richer understanding of how they're likely to react to a policy. Yeah. So, I mean, I I guess, I mean, my take from this would be you, you, you don't necessarily have to be, to embrace some of these ideas, you don't necessarily have to be critical of the notion of expertise as such. Um, but you would want to have an environment where there's more there's pluralism, where expertise is not the only thing to be considered. That yeah. There are different types of knowledge that should also be considered in, you know, what we might consider to be more effective decision making process that actually recognises this pluralism yeah. of experience. I mean, I think I think that's right. I think another way of putting a similar point would be to say that I'm not really against expertise. I'm against a particular type of expertise. That is, I'm against expertise that treats social life as made up of natural kinds. And what I want is a a form of expertise 
which is based on a richer understanding of people's meanings, reasons, and how those inform different actions against different historical contexts. But what do you think would be the difference then, if I may ask, about, say, the kind of advice that a social scientist who is looking to, say, influence Mm -hmm. public policy might give if they're informed by that view, as opposed to the kind of advice might be given by a social scientist who is influenced by some notion that there are real essences or that there is some more kind of positivistic understanding of of social life? How would the kind of advice differ? Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, if we imagine, imagine, uh, take an example of someone who is doing work that wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be seen as interpretivist. So perhaps they're developing models of the economy or of organisations based on rational choice-like principles. Um, Well, I think that they they would need to see their models or their classificatory systems, if they were more institutionist minded, as something more like heuristics. And a lot of them do. Yeah. Right? A lot of them do. But at the moment, the, the claim, oh, I see this as a heuristic, more or less disappears from their writing. And I strongly suspect that it also more or less disappears from what they're saying when they're speaking truth to power. Um, so the claim, all I have here is a loose heuristic that you might find useful to think with about this case. Let me think about it with this case with you disappears from what's actually going on into the expertise. So it's again, it's not that I would necessarily oppose other methods, including model building, whether that's deductive rational choice models or computational statistical models, I wouldn't necessarily oppose them. I would just want them to enter the policy making process in this much more nuanced way. And I would want them there to be joined more heavily than they currently are in most policy areas by people who uh, who are engaged in typically ethnographic work, admittedly, on the targets of those policies. Let's imagine that you're looking at um, residents of a housing estate and you're asking, what would happen if we redesign the estate in this way? Uh, And the more local it gets, the more you already would naturally start to engage people. But I would want that in other areas as well, in areas like security policy, counter-terrorism policy. I think community governance should play much more role than it does in counter-terrorism policy, for example. Do you think there's any... I mean, I guess I would ask the question of how how realistic is that in the sense of aren't politicians, and maybe I'm here guilty of attributing some kind of essence to the political type, mm. aren't they um, almost inevitably going to look for quite simplistic kind of interpretations of what social science might say? Or I mean, is it reasonable to expect that we could expect a more nuanced understanding um, from politicians who ultimately are still involved in political battles they're trying to assert their um the value of their ideas versus what they see to be opposing sets of ideas um the intellectual interest of politicians and social science varies enormously but (laughs) it would obviously be extremely foolish to imagine that most politicians are going to do anything else than grab at things that look like solutions So the change one's looking for is really a change within social science. What you're really looking for is for social scientists to systematically start to recognise and pursue their research in a way that draws more on post-foundational and post-analytic philosophies and less on positivist and modernist ideas. And part of the problem there... You could, I'm going to state something that's very boldly, which is not really as true as I'm going to make it sound. But in very bold terms, most philosophers of social science or history today are post-foundational and post-analytic. And the philosophical debate is largely one. Most social scientists have virtually no philosophical background whatsoever. And they they actually are under the illusion that, say, Popper is is an alternative to positivism, when he he isn't. And and that's to imagine that we're in a philosophical world of, what, 50 years ago? And and so part of the problem is the disjuncture 
between what goes on in philosophy departments and the kinds of ideas that are thrown about by social scientists. Um, and, and I can be very pessimistic about this, actually. I mean, if, if I put on my more Weberian or Foucauldian hat, I can see modernist social science as a kind of, I don't know, um, virus, really, or, or, or kind of rationality that's getting more and more strong and more and more powerful and closing down and ruling over more and more areas of social life. And I can see attempts to disrupt it as futile. I mean, I've mentioned in, in this yeah. discussion, I've mentioned a couple of times, differences and debates yeah. between interpretivists. Um, because I come from a more philosophical background, and perhaps also because my my family were non-conformists. I, I really like my doctrinal debates. So, so I used to be very keen on, where, on, on picking out exactly where I disagree with other hmm. interpretivists. Hmm. But now it seems to me we're, that the number of interpretivists in a kind of increasingly positivistic global so, social science is so small hmm. that that's almost pointless. Yeah. Um, and it totally misses the point. And I, I can get very grumpy. It's not sure that's the right word, but let's go with it. I can get very grumpy with, for instance, people who spend hours debating whether Foucault said this or that, or yeah. what's a pure Foucauldianism. Yeah. I mean, rational choice would not be where it is today if it was called arrow studies, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I do think that Really, it, 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 I don't quite want to say it's a lost battle, but uh, it can I, it can feel like that at times. It can feel as though. Well, can, can I just follow up on something on that? So, I mean, I've read some of your 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 work on Foucault actually, which I think is really really interesting, um, and it, it strikes me there's a there's a sort of irony in that um, one of the things that you point out about about his work is. And this is, I guess, one of these debates with other interpretivists. Um, you emphasise that there needs to be a role for agency, um, some notion of creativity that people can resist dominant epistemes or forms of governmentality, that there has to be some scope for that in order to explain how change actually happens, mm -hmm. all these unpredictable aspects. So you have what is often considered to be an approach which is associated with sort of post-structuralist type ideas, actually having really, in the way you describe it, quite a significant role for agency. Whether you would call it individual agency, I'm not sure, but it's certainly an agency-centred view or that has some role mm -hmm. for it. And then paradoxically, you have an awful lot of rational choice theory, which is supposed to be based on methodological individualism, which has this very rigid view of how individuals are supposed to behave in particular situations, which is much more predictive um, in terms of the what it, what it thinks social science can actually achieve, um, and which isn't really in some ways um, that agency-centered. It seems almost structuralist in its, in its, its implications. I find that quite fascinating. I mean, is that is that is that a, a sort of dilemma that you you, you picked up on or question? That yeah, you I on? think it is. I mean, I if I go back to the first book I published, which was the logic of the history of ideas, I I'm still quite proud of that book. In some ways, it's my favourite of my books, but. I would write it very differently if I was write it today. It, it reads to me. Uh, and I'm sure it reads much worse to other people. Uh, or I think of it today as a very internal dialogue with myself, really, where I'm fixated on trying to get my own ideas right. And I use an almost private language at times. Um, and I don't think I do enough to open it up to other people. So how does that apply to what you were just saying? Well, I think in the book I just simply use the word agency for what I mean. Over time, I've come to call what I mean, uh, what I'm groping for, situated agency. Yeah. And part of what is going on there is a distinction I do make in the book between agency and autonomy. Mm. And by autonomy, I mean the idea that people can act for reasons of their own, mm. 
where those reasons are things they adopt outside of any cultural or social influence. Yeah. That idea strikes me, it's an enlightenment yeah. idea, and yeah. it strikes me as utterly fallacious. Yeah. Situated agency says that people inherit a set of beliefs, mm. which they, from the society and culture around them, that those ideas thus vary from person to person, culture yeah. to culture, society to society. But whatever they might be, the situated agent within that situation is then capable of reflecting Mm. on those ideas and changing them. Mm. So that's the notion of agency I'm after, is that notion of situated agency. Um, And then if I contrast it first with the rational choice people, I, I I think that their notion of agency actually is not about reasoning at all. Um, it's a, instead it's about individual action mm-hmm. and the, behind the action lies a loosely formalised set of assumptions rather than a variable historical context so I think my notion of agency is entirely different from that yeah. adopted by rational choice thinkers if I switch to talk about Foucault I I I think it's complicated, (laughs) by which I mean that I have at least three things to say. The first thing I have to say is that on my reading of Foucault, in his earlier, more archaeological works, when he is avowedly opposed to agency, he is opposed to agency not on philosophical grounds, but on methodological ones. So if you read, for instance, the preface to The Order of Things, he's quite clear that he's interested in methodologically in what it would be to write a history of ideas without evoking the author. And that's a different I claim from one that says philosophically there's no such thing as agency. Yeah. And when he turns to his more genealogical writings, I again don't think he's necessarily opposed to agency. I think he's opposed to explanation. So I think he then, he's given up on the idea that there are epistemes or quasi-structures that define discourses or what happens on the surface. And instead, he says, he just wants to stay on the surface and describe what he finds there. And because he's not interested in explanation, it's just these descriptive categories, he's not that interested in the role of agents and and human beings in creating and bringing these things into being. So that would be how I would loosely read Foucault, and it would make him at least would make him at least potentially compatible with what I'm doing. I'm not sure he would yeah. agree with what I'm doing, but yeah. it would make him at least potentially compatible. Um, so that would be one thing I would want to say. The second thing I would want to say is that it seems to me a lot of Foucauldians, people influenced by Foucault want to suggest that they they want to suggest that they do recognize a role for what I'm calling agency. Mm. And when criticized for not doing so, they say, oh but we do. And maybe they appeal to a text or two of Foucault's on counterconduct as containing this sort of idea. Um, but in their own work they very, very, very rarely evoke the sort of agency I mean. So if you read work on governmentality, it's virtually always about the spread of of, of ruling sets of ideas and the way in which they colonise new areas of practice. Yeah. And it's virtually never about the way in which particular agents transform or distort those ideas or reinterpret them. So they pay lip service to agency, but it doesn't appear much in their practice. And then the third thing I would want to say, I think is probably to go back to my earlier point and say that in some ways I think harping on about these debates is a narcissism of small differences. And yeah. in some ways I don't think it's that important what how we read Foucault or what he did. It would be more important to discuss things like, do, should we believe in agency? And if we should... How should it appear in the sort of research we write up? Should we just be focusing primarily on the way in which neoliberal discourses colonise other spaces? Or should we see neoliberal as a contingent category which can have different meanings in different spaces that doesn't have an essence that's crafted by different people against the background of different traditions? And what are the benefits intellectually, practically, politically of these different ways of thinking and doing interpretive research. Okay. 
the centre here is within a department of political economy. So we've got people in the department who are coming more from an economics background, people more from a poli-sci background, and other people from political theory. I wonder whether you could say a little bit about whether or not you think some of the concepts that you that you use um, in this interpretive type of social science can say something to economists um, or the type of questions that um, economists are interested in. So if we take, and I, again, I don't know whether, you know, this is me being guilty of assuming essences here, but, but take, for example, the notion that resource scarcity is a constraint in some sense that all societies face. Um, what can we then do in terms of applying an interpretive approach within that context that doesn't end up with some of the more mechanical type explanations that you get from perhaps overly economistic or rational choice type approaches? Is there a way in which we can retain some core of economics which recognises the importance of scarcity but that incorporates more of a kind of interpretive social science that you um, are concerned with, or, or are is economics not something that can actually be analysed through an interpretive lens? Well, economic activity can obviously be analysed through an interpretive lens, but economics as an academic discipline. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine an interpretive style of economics. You can you could say, well, it would sort of at spaces resemble the kind of historical economics that arose in the 19th century. Maybe it would overlap in places with things like sociological economics. Yeah. So, of course, you can imagine it. But within most economics departments, those are really, really minority interests. So I think it's hard to imagine economics as currently conceived redesigning itself as an interpretivist research program. So I think perhaps what you would be looking for is for economists to explore and take more seriously the sort of philosophical ideas that underlie interpretivism and think more about what those ideas mean for the kind of let's call it from the moment, knowledge they're generating. Yeah. So if they actually think they're generating knowledge, that would be important. But I strongly suspect a lot of them don't. I, I think those that are engaged in more econome econometric-like studies probably think they are generating knowledge. So for them, it would be relevant. But for econo particularly for more deductive, theoretical-style e economists, I think it would be more thinking about what it means to be to, to think of their models as heuristics, what the role of heuristics... I mean, let's imagine that one of them has produced a model of, I don't know, bureau shaping, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And let's say, and they say, here's my model, it's a heuristic, right? That's good. That seems to do quite a lot of work for them because in saying this model is heuristic, they fend off all the philosophical criticisms mm. that otherwise might be offered about the oversimplification of their assumptions the, yeah. you know, and other such things. So it seems quite a sensible move, and it's by no means uncommon amongst economists. But it raises other questions, because if it's a heuristic, then we should be asking them, and they should be thinking for themselves, what is a heuristic? What constitutes a good heuristic? What mm. set of criteria mark out a good heuristic? And why does my model meet those criteria? Yeah. So I might be interested in bureau shaping and I might open a Shakespeare play and I might get a great idea into, that really enables me to understand some aspect of British policy mm. making and the remaking of departments of state in a way that I hadn't before. So Shakespeare's play has there acted as a heuristic of me, for me, right? Mm. And I want to know why an, economist, an economic model of bureau shaping is a better heuristic than Shakespeare's play, right? I think, it, I think in many circumstances it probably is, but the case needs to be made and it's not made. So, I do, so to say that I want the economists to think more about what it would mean to treat their knowledge as, in some sense, post with from the background of a post-foundational philosophy. I'm a bit like I was saying earlier about 
uh, generally social science colleagues write a sentence or two at the beginning of their papers mm. that are disclaimers, but they don't take it seriously. The same thing happens in economics, right? You get disclaimers. Oh, my model's just a heuristic. Or my, my model is valid because it mm. works deductively. But that doesn't mean it's true, right? Mm. So you can retreat to deductive validity rather than truth as the claim you're making about your model. And I, I approve of those things because basically I agree. Basically, I think, A, they are heuristics. And B, if the model's properly constructed, by definition, it's deductively valid, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't disagree with those claims. But what's missing there is what it means to take the retreat to those claims seriously. And what is if you take the ret that retreat seriously, if you say, I'm just offering this as a deductively valid heuristic, then you need to explain why that's a worthwhile activity and why yeah. it's useful. Just go on finally, perhaps just one of these you know big questions perhaps perhaps a bit um unfair i'm not i'm not, I'm not sure but um i take you know to be a pretty significant implication of a, a lot of what you're saying is that people are looking for order in the world um that really isn't there right. <laughs> that there isn't a lot of order out there um but the nature of a lot of social science is to try to find order. Why do you think it is that people are so uncomfortable, seemingly, with the notion that maybe we just can't fully understand what's going on, that it is essentially a chaotic, uh, complex world, that whatever regularities there are are just temporary ones or contingent on certain uh, fleeting conditions. Why is that something that people it seems find very unsettling maybe i'm assuming too much here maybe i'm thinking that it's because it's unsettling that people are sort of resistant mm -hmm. to it but the idea that the world is essentially out of control um isn't something that many people i think in the general public but academics politicians yeah. whoever really feel comfortable with what is that the case and, and if so why yeah i think i think it is um it's an interesting point because of course there are things within the social sciences like complexity theory yeah. which would avowedly accept the world is complex so i'm not sure com complexity is quite the word i would want to go for no. but i'm not sure what is the word i would want to go for but when you get complexity theory what you get is an attempt to domesticate complexity by suggesting we can grasp it within an abstract formal theory akin to mm. other institutionalist functionalist style of explanations and we can use that theory to manage the complexity yeah. so i think perhaps out of control is a or beyond our control is a better phrase than something like complexity because then you yeah. can extend it to be to, to say there's something wrong with that sort of complexity theory as well so why are we so reluctant to I, I think I would want to go back historically. I'm going to end up suggesting that it's a failure to come to terms with the death of God. So I think if we go back historically, what we're really saying is people are failing to come to terms with the fact that social kinds, social concepts aren't given. They're not natural kinds in the way that, say, water is. And I think... The assumption that the world is made up of kinds is clearly one that was heavily built into Judeo-Christian religious traditions because God had created the kinds. Um, Darwin really does do away with that idea, even at the level of species. So we know that species aren't natural kinds. We know that they've evolved out of other species. There's no one point where you know, humans evolve out of H. There's it just mm. uh, any attempt to assert one would just be by fear to say on this side, we're going to call it X and on this side, we're going to call it Y, right? And there's no natural kind there which separates them into different entities, even as species. So one of the things that happens around what's called the death of God, the rise of Victorian science and particularly evolution, um, is that we move from a world that's populated by natural kinds to one that's really messy and where our concepts are used to catch a fuzziness in the mess. So our, our concepts are always, I suppose, what we might think of as pragmatic. They're crafted to do things for us in describing, explaining, acting within this mess 
rather than they capture natural kinds within this mess. This is particularly true of social science concepts. I don't necessarily think it's true of all other concepts. Um, and I think that what you're therefore looking at is a failure to draw out the explanations of a shift from a religious Judeo-Christian view to a post-evolutionary view. And I think that the reason people are reluctant to do that, I mean, partly I think it's just a failure to think things through. But I think underneath, of course, Christianity, religion always gave people a sense of control and meaning and order. And I think it's no accident that social science has stepped in to offer a sense of control, meaning and order at exactly the time that we've become an increasingly secular society. So if we're talking specifically about social science, I think that the nature of social science and the role of social science in public life is explained in, in part, at least, by an attempt to have a sense of order and control in a secular world, where philosophically secular, so without God. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a that's a, an amazing thought to um, to finish the, the podcast on Mark. So um, I hope everybody's enjoyed uh, listening. I, I've certainly enjoyed talking to you, Mark. So thank, thank you very you. much, and thank you very much for visiting the department here at King's. Thank, thank you very you. much for hosting me. <laughs>